It's really funny how many obstacles it has been. The company has been three, four, five times close to bankruptcy. Maserati, I think they just were on their knees to God every night. I think that few people in life work so hard. They survived by, uh, by building exquisite cars. They are extremely strong cars, extremely beautiful cars, and very fast. Maserati. For more than a hundred years, this family name has been synonymous with excellence, innovation, and determination. The iconic story of Maserati begins at the end of the 19th century in Voghera, in the Italian region of Lombardy. There, between 1881 and 1898, Rodolfo Maserati and his wife Carolina give birth to seven sons. Five of the surviving boys inherit the father's love of machines and engines. Hence, they want to become auto engineers, builders, and designers. It is Carlo who, at an early stage, inspires and paves the way for the actual four Maserati brothers, Alfieri, Bindo, Ettore, and Ernesto. Carlo Maserati. He was uh, a genius, no doubt, and uh, he started to show this genetic when he was still a kid. And uh, at 10 years old, he was already able to uh, build with his hands a small uh, locomotive with a steam engine that was working and whistling. He works with Isotto Fraschini, known for the production of cars which are among the most luxurious and prestigious ever built. Soon, Carlo was able to get Alfieri a job there too. Bindo and Ettore are soon to join them. It is immediately clear that the DNA of the Maserati brothers is dominated by their passion for engines. I remember my grandmother often remarking when the cars came out of the workshop, I do not understand why these guys always have to go so fast. There was certainly no family influence into this world of racing. Young Alfieri is only 16 at the time, but it does not take long for him to impress the company's owners who employ him as a racing driver. In 1911, Carlo passes away. Far too early, he is only 30 years old. Thus, he never sees the success of the company he helped inspire. Four years later, Alfieri Maserati leaves Isotto Fraschini to rent a garage in Bologna's Via di Pepoli. On December 1st, 1914, the doors open at the Societa Anonima Officini Alfieri Maserati. The nucleus of the company is formed by Alfieri, Ettore, and Ernesto. Their only scope was racing. You know? They started in transforming cars from other producers, but the real uh, vision was, and the real passion was, we want to build our own race car, a Maserati race car, and we want to win races. Alfieri pushes the expansion of the production of spark plugs, brakes, and cylinder blocks. It becomes a highly important source of the company's income. 
Unfortunately, the First World War causes a halt in the evolutionary process of the company. It is only in the early 1920s that the engines begin revving again on the test benches. The ambitious men contribute to everything mechanical in every possible innovative way. Even their artist brother Mario makes a lasting mark in the car world. For his design, a three-pointed spear called a trident, he draws inspiration from the fountain of Neptune, the Roman god of the sea that stands in Bologna. Mario considers this particularly appropriate for his brother's car company. Neptune represents strength and vigor. Today, a hundred years later, this logo is a symbol of its racing heritage. It serves as a constant reminder of the company's core belief that everything it will build in the next 100 years will be the absolute opposite of ordinary. The expressive logo has since graced all Maseratis around the world, starting with the very first all-Maserati racer produced by the company. Finally, Uncle Alfieri, who was considered the head of the force, introduced the Primavera Maserati, the 26th because it was built in 1926. As good behind the wheel as he is under the hood, Alfieri, assisted by mechanic Guerino Bertocchi, attends the 1926 Targa Florio, one of the toughest endurance races at the time, with a 67-mile route that weaves along the narrow mountain roads of the island of Sicily in the south of Italy. That was a very special race. The race went up and down hilly roads. We drove through villages, the beautiful country, mountains. So it was quite difficult to know the track well. We're talking about the longest circuit in the world. And that was the only race where you drove past crowds of spectators on both sides. That was dangerous. And we were lucky. Only a very small error would have been enough to kill 50 or 60 people. The two-seater race car, a 1.5-liter straight eight, is relatively primitive with leaf springs and cable-operated drum brakes, but it has plenty of power. The 120 horsepower it produces are enough to get Alfieri's flyweight car to a top speed of 118 miles per hour. He went uh, there and he won his class, in spite of the fact that he has to stop for a long time. And uh, that was the beginning of the Maserati car. The original eight-cylinder Tipo 26 then evolves into a number of different versions. Based on these, the 26M is designed in 1930. Nineteen thirty has been a fantastic year for Maserati. All started in the Royal Grand Prix of Rome, and from that race on, we won practically all the Grand Prix. The twenty-six M dominates the nineteen thirty Grand Prix season. Stroke upon stroke, the car collects laurels and trophies. In the first half of the 1931 Grand Prix season, the 26M loses to the Alfa Romeos and Bugattis. However, with a higher bore and improved carburetors, the new 26M and Luigi Fagioli win at the fourth Grand Premio di Monza. Under Alfieri's supervision, the Maseratis produce a number of impressive record-setting races, including the Tipo V4. The giant 16-cylinder engine is a combination of two Tipo 26B inline eight engines. The car is a whale of a racer with a weight of almost a ton. Despite that, in 1929, a V4 with Baconin Borzacchini behind the wheel sets the first world record in Maserati's history during the Cremona flying 10 kilometers. The Italian achieves the almost incredible average speed of 153 miles per hour. 
The following year, in 1930, the same man takes the V4 to its first Grand Prix win in Tripoli. These successes are a huge windfall for Maserati, helping to raise the funds and acclaim that allow it to boost its operations. All seems to go well. However, in contrast to the machines he produces, Alfieri Maserati is not in robust health. In March 1932, he is only 44 and suffering from a severe kidney problem. So he decided to go and uh, resolve this problem. And that was a big mistake of the number one surgeon in Bologna at that time. This professor made a mistake and he died. His death not only affects the Maserati family, but the racing world as well. Ernesto, Bindo, and Ettore now have to face the challenges and winds of change without their charismatic and entrepreneurial brother and leader. Alfieri's brother Ernesto takes over as the head of development. He and his brothers stand out in many ways. For instance, they adopt hydraulic brakes before any other auto manufacturers. The system is introduced into the 8CM in 1933. The single-seater manages a top speed of almost 155 miles per hour. The company soon realizes the frame is not sturdy enough. While the car's light weight helps it achieve speed, the relatively flimsy frame makes controlling the 8CM difficult. The situation improves when the flying Mantuan, race driver Tazio Nuvolari, suggests that the front section of the car be strengthened and its overall weight reduced. He wrote a check to buy a car. Nuvolari <laughs> wanted so badly that car that, okay, paid for that car and bought. And from that year, he started to race for us. In that year, 1933, Nouvelle and the HCM win the Belgian Grand Prix and several others. In the years to come, however, the Trident struggles to keep up with the pace of the Alfa Romeo, and especially Mercedes and Auto Union. With the political changes in Germany, the racing world becomes even more competitive. The Führer wants to prove that his countrymen are the best in everything, including auto racing. With their 6CM and 8CTF, Maserati challenges the all-conquering dominance of Germany on the Grand Prix scene of the 30s. With a 3-liter supercharged engine, the 8CTF has a top speed of almost 180 miles per hour. Two factors make its development possible. A new and complicated international formula crafted with a single purpose of curtailing the German juggernaut. And the acquisition of Maserati in 1937 by wealthy Modenese industrialist Aldolfo Orsi. The businessman started out with nothing to establish himself as a leading figure in the Italian steel industry. The Maserati brothers are excellent mechanics, but they are not talented businessmen. The company was uh, burdened with debts and was very hard. The three brothers had to work like hell, day and night for years. I don't think they really had too much idea on the cost of these sort of things. And when they got paid for them, I mean, you know, it just disappeared, the money in development or something else like that. And that's why it needed somebody to get them in there. Uh, my grandfather was not a car guy. He was uh, an entrepreneur. He understood that the car was the very important for the time and will be also more important for the future. The friendly takeover puts the Maserati brothers in charge of the cars, and Orsi takes control of management, moving the Maserati Enterprises from Bologna to its new and present home in Modena. Orsi has business operations there and wants to focus his work at one location. 
As stipulated by the sales contract, the Maserati brothers stay with Adolfo Orsi's new Maserati for 10 years. The first result of the new collaboration is the further development of the 8 CTF. The Maserati company has the tradition in breaking records. In the 30s, in 1936-37, we were detaining uh, up to 13 international records, 13 at the same time. I think in terms of racing cars, um, uh, Maserati have, have punched so much above their weight over so many years, uh, it's extraordinary. Even in the United States, the 8 CTF enjoys a highly rewarding career. A powerful engine with some 365 brake horsepower combined with formidable reliability. These are the factors that allow Wilbur Shaw to collect these two famous wins. It is the first time an Italian car wins the legendary race Indy 500. Irrepeatable for an Italian manufacturer. In Sicily, Maserati continues to be the leading force. A decade after the great success at the 1926 Targa Florio, Maserati succeeds in winning this race four years in a row from 1937 till 1940. But as the clouds of the Second World War gather, the number of races being held decreases drastically. Italy joins the fighting in 1940. Soon, car makers like Maserati turn their focus towards making vehicles, tools, and machinery to aid the war effort. The war brings motor racing to a virtual halt. Still, the Maserati brothers make use of the dark years. They continue to work on designs for future cars. Adolfo Orsi is a savvy businessman. He wants to build vehicles other than racing cars to satisfy its high-end clientele. He intends to expand the Maserati name beyond the racetrack. In 1947, the A6 1500 is unveiled. The first kind of Gran Turismo, A6 Pininfarina, designed uh, shortly after the Second World War. It created an, an entire segment which was not covered by other car companies for many, many years. The first test model by Carrozzeria Pininfarina is a two-seater coupe. Small changes include the addition of two smaller back seats to accommodate passengers. My grandfather understood that uh, there was uh, a niche called the carrozzeria, where there was the possibility to e express his creativity and do something that was uh, not only luxury, but possibly grand luxury. So this was uh, the inspiration. Battista Pininfarina creates almost all the coupe bodies of the A6 1500 with only a few deviations. With the car, he hits the public's nerve. The things that he did were very much projected in the future, so absolutely visionary. He was an inventor. However, the order of the boss Adolfo Orsi to focus more on road cars does not mean the end of the Maserati racers. The his um, strategy was to win a race on Sunday and to sell industrial products uh, during the week. On the resumption of competition in 1946, the Maserati 4CL proves the class of the field. Luigi Villaresi immediately returns to winning ways, taking victory in the first race following the cessation of hostilities, the 1946 Nice Grand Prix. We started after the war to win again. Then uh, my father and uncles left 
The mid-1940s signal the impending end of the Maserati family's involvement with the company that bears its name. They remained as technical director for 10 years, till 1947. The ten-year contract between the Maserati brothers and Adolfo Orsi, signed ten years earlier, is coming to an end. I think that uh, was a very difficult decision to take, also for them. But at the end, uh, it prevailed uh, the idea that uh, they were returning uh, to a kind of small shop uh, where they could uh, produce only racing cars with no problems with trade unions. The three brothers open a new factory called the Officini Specializzate Construzioni Automobili, better known as Oscar. They continue to make cars until 1963, when their company is sold. It's unfortunate that the family connection uh, did not continue all the way through, but uh, of course, uh, they went up the road a little, and there was Oscar. And Oscar was, a, a, in a way, a little bit of a continuation of some of the racing heritage of uh, Maserati. The Maseratis have left, but Maserati is enjoying a post-war boom. The 4CLT, a single-seat racing car still designed by Ernesto Maserati, becomes the car of choice for many privateer entrants, like Prince Bira, a member of Siam's royal family. I remember saying to Bira we were going to go somewhere and uh, he had a couple of girls with him. I said, well, what gives with the girls? He said, well, in cars, we have a spare car, so I brought a spare girl. <laughs> a bit of crumpet. We just thought we were filled the bill pretty well. The T in the 4CLT's name derives from the tubular frame that takes some of the merit for this success. It increases the single-seat car's power to 260 horsepower, generating a top speed of about 170 miles per hour. The late 1940s proved to be the car's most successful era. It wins no less than 18 post-war Grand Prix and five other races. The 1949 San Remo Grand Prix, held over two heats, is won by Juan Manuel Fangio from Argentina. The 1950 Monaco Grand Prix is marred by a large pileup during the first lap when a wave from the harbor floods the track at Tabak Corner. Nino Farina spins and crashes. Those who are behind him, including Fangio on Alfa Romeo, try to stop or avoid the carnage. Eight more drivers crash and retire. Fangio wins. Louis Chiron takes third place with a Maserati 4 CLT. Before the World War, Maserati was challenged by the Germans in particular. In the post-war racing scene, Maserati has to battle with a new competitor, Ferrari. The prancing horse comes out with faster, more powerful cars. At the start of the 1950s, Maserati finds itself looking to reclaim its former place as a front-runner in automotive racing. Joaquino Colombo takes control of design at Maserati in 1952, working to improve the A6 GCM racer. In the 1953 Formula One season, all races counting towards the Drivers World Championship are run under Formula Two regulations. Although it features good basic design, Maserati only wins one of the year's World Championship events, the Gran Premio d'Italia at Monza with Juan Manuel Fangio at the wheel. He and the Tridente come in second in the World Championship behind Ferrari. It is an all-Italian battle. The design department is faced with never-ending big tasks and challenges. Orsi wants Maserati to compete in the World Sports Car Championship and stand a fair chance. 
To this end, the A6 GCS is further developed. The very first of its kind was the final race car designed by the Maserati brothers in 1947. That year, and in 1948, this A6 GCS won the Italian championship. Five years later, the A6 GCS 53, with 170 brake horsepower, is developed. These racers win at the Italian Championships in 1953 and 1954. They also take first places at the 1954 Giro di Sicilia, the Irish Tourist Trophy, and at the Targa Florio in Sicily. Maserati's best overall result at Emilia Emilia is the third place achieved in the 1954 race in an A6 GCS. Some 60 years later still, some of these racers with a top speed of 150 miles per hour participate in the new edition of the Millimilia, such as a splendid A6 GCS 53 from 1954, designed by Medardo Fantuzzi. They're all made from different carrozia, uh, but it's the chassis and it's the engine and it's the running gear that's Maserati. I have to be honest to tell you, I love this car. Its driving performance uh, is very easy, and yet the car is also forgiving. Uh, if you understand what I mean by forgiving, is that if the driver, you know, makes a slight mistake, it's uh, not uh, uh, fatal because the car somehow is able to recover. My A6 GCS is very loud, and I love it. The sound of the engine, to me, is like music. I mean, we, we get in the car, we drive it, not down the street, but on the highway or at some place where you can exercise it. And the sound is just fantastic. It's, it's guttural, it's melodious, it's strong, and uh, it's something that makes the Maserati very distinctive. The sound of music, reinterpreted many times by its master, also in four Berlinettas and one Spider created by Pininfarina. Maserati has a very strong, uh, sporty heritage and image, uh, so it was a very attractive brand uh, to work with. Uh. In 1953, Ferrari intends to sign Battista Pininfarina to make him the company's main coachwork builder. However, Maserati suggests that he should create a new road sports car by building bodies for a few of its A6 GCS 53 racing chassis. As no one wants to offend Enzo Ferrari, a clever scheme is found to prevent Pininfarina from having any official contacts with Maserati. The A6 GCS 53 chassis are sold to a renowned concessionaire of Maserati, who then commissions Pininfarina to create their coachwork. The model wins the undisputed status of one of the most beautiful cars of all time. The 53 uh, is a masterpiece. It's uh, an absolute masterpiece of the, of the 50s uh, uh, of my grandfather. The muscular body of this sports car and the harmony, uh, the personality, outstanding. Fantastic, fantastic Pininfarina design. It is generally accepted that perhaps the greatest racing car of all time is the Maserati 250F. The Duecento Cinquanta F is one of the most important Maserati cars of this era, produced between 1954 and 1958. It first races in the 1954 Argentine Grand Prix. The Formula One race is won by Juan Manuel Fangio. It is his first victory in his native Argentina. With points gained with both the 250F and later in that year with Mercedes-Benz, Fangio wins the 1954 Drivers' World Championship. In total, he will win five such titles. 
The high-performance single-seater sees continual developments over its production run between early 1954 and late 1960. In its era, it racks up 55 wins, eight of which are Grand Prix victories. This in the hands of both Fangio and another legendary driver, Sterling Moss. The Englishman races his privately owned 250F for the full 1954 season. It was the, the nicest balance of any Formula One car that I ever drove. It was a car that you could win with Monaco. With a Monaco, it's a very, very difficult circuit because it's very restricted and so on. And the Mazda was terrific there. The feelings that I know Sterling has uh, about 250Fs uh, are something which I can well imagine uh, because of the short uh, connection uh, I had. Uh, it becomes a love affair. In 1957, various and assorted financial ills of both the factory and on a national scale forced Maserati to the brink of bankruptcy. Drastic measures are implemented and funding slashed for the racing team. Some creditors are willing to either forgive or reduce debts if Maserati captures both the Drivers Championship and the World Sports Car Championship of that year. Fangio experiences what is probably the most memorable victory of his career behind the wheel of a 250F in Monaco in 1957. Despite a hesitant start, Moss leads away on the first lap in front of Collins, Fangio, and Hawthorne. On lap four, coming out of the tunnel, there is mayhem. Moss goes straight through the chicane, sending debris from the wrecked barrier crashing onto the circuit. Collins crashes through the K-side barriers, trying to avoid it. Fangio and Brooks slow to make their way through the carnage. Brooks' effort is for naught, being hit by Mike Hawthorne's Ferrari. Fangio on Maserati takes the lead from Brooks' damaged car and holds it to the checkered flag. The driver Fangio replaced at Maserati, Sterling Morse, is now with the Van Wall team. Between them, Fangio and Moss win every Grand Prix of the 1957 season, Fangio taking four victories to Moss's three. Fangio's drive at the Nürburgring is often cited as one of the greatest victories in racing history. The ride of the gods, the lap of the gods, the race of the gods occurred when, um, after a, a mangled pit stop where a, a wheel knockoff had fallen underneath a the car, they couldn't find it for minutes. It put Fangio behind the two factory Ferraris. And um, Fangio goes out and sets a lap record. The next lap, he beats that lap record. And he continues to do this till he eventually catches the two Ferraris and, uh, and wins the German Grand Prix, clinching the championship in 1957 for himself and for Maserati. El Maestro himself comments, I have never driven that fast before in my life, and I don't think I will ever be able to do it again. For virtuosos such as Fangio and Sterling Moss, the Maserati race cars are the equivalent of a Stradivarius, an instrument on which they can display their virtuosity. I could beat him in sports cars, but in Formula One, which is the pinnacle of driving, I, he, he had just the edge, and then that's the way it went. Fangio just did have some extra little flair. Fangio is the embodiment of strategist and tactician, but nothing would work out that way without the legendary mechanics, like Guerino Bertocchi, who is also the test driver for Fangio and other Maserati racers. Not one of the brand's cars leaves the factory without his approval. I heard that they got testing and, and he put the duff plug in one of the cylinders. So Fangio drove, he said, no, it's no good. It's frowning bad and it's, it's not firing in all cylinders. And, oh, let me see. And he just checks up and then he said, oh, yes, it's a plug wrong, you know, so he changed the plug and then the car goes perfect. And so he looks very good. <laughs> he always used to do the trick. 
Giulio Alfieri is Maserati's chief engineer in the 1950s and 1960s and responsible for one of the most powerful cars of its generation, the 450S. It is a favorite to win the coveted World Sports Car Championship in 1957. But car troubles and other problems get in the way, also with the 1957 edition of the Mini Melia. And Sterling Moss is out of the race with a broken brake pedal. As with James, we only just started the Mili Melia. And uh, I put my foot in it, my foot shot to the floor. And so I nudged Jake's and looked at and there were only two pedals there. <laughs> and he sort of tugged on his beard like this. <laughs> I mean, it was a, thank God it was, it was no drama. The Spanish Marquis Alfonso de Portago once commented, I won't die in an accident, but of old age or I'll be executed in some gross miscarriage of justice. On May 12, 1957, during the Mille Miglia, Portago drives a Ferrari 335S. He stops alongside the course, kisses his girlfriend, and drives on to his destiny. In a straight road section, only 45 miles from Brescia, the start and finish point of the event race, Portago, who is third, suffers a tire defect at 150 miles per hour. The 335 hurtles over a canal and spins into the crowd lining the highway, killing Portago, his co-driver, and 10 spectators, among them five children. And with them, the Mille Miglia. After this tragedy, Maserati decides to retire from factory racing participation, though they continue to build cars for privateers. I'm lucky that I'm still alive. Fortunately, I have not managed to die. I've tried two or three times, but luckily it didn't work. I'm sorry, but I feel motor racing should be unsafe. If you don't like that, then you go and play tennis. Moss, therefore, continues to race. Now on Ferrari, he's out there again to challenge the Tridente, in particular, the Maserati 450S that Fangio is due to compete with at the Cuban Grand Prix of 1958. I was there when Fangio was kidnapped. On the eve of the race, the Argentinian is abducted from his hotel by Fidel Castro's rebel comrades. Fangio very kindly said, look, don't, don't grab for Sterling because he's, he's just going to get married. This is my first wife. So don't, don't capture him and so on. So they took, they took him and got all the publicity anyway. The Cuban government orders the race to continue while Fangio is kept from competing in his Maserati. He was allowed to watch the race, that was it. Yeah, quite extraordinary. Just as well for Fangio, Armando Garcia Cifuentes crashes his Ferrari into the crowd, killing seven spectators. This tragedy bolsters Maserati's decision to withdraw from official team racing. Despite this step, race cars are still being developed and built, such as the Eldorado Special, constructed in 1958 for the 500 Miglia di Monza. But the production of this 420 M58 isn't financed by the Maserati factory. It is made possible solely due to the sponsorship of the Eldorado Ice Cream Company. Even Daredevil Sterling Moss really does feel fear when he is doing 170 miles per hour in such an Eldorado. At Monza, the fastest motor racing track in the world. From my point of view, the only thing I didn't like, I was on the top of the banking, and I'm going around about this much down from the armco, and suddenly my arms crossed. Well, I'm not stupid, I knew something was wrong. And so I just closed my eyes, put my foot on the brake, which were very, very small. And uh, luckily just spun down to the infield and that was it. Sterling Morse remembers opening his eyes and thinking, if this is hell. It must be hot and dusty as well, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Is it a race car or a sculpture? Maserati aren't running a factory team any longer, 
but the company does develop cars that private individuals can use to compete. The most famous, the Types 60 and 61, the birdcage Maseratis. If you look at the structure and how this was created, um, incredible. They are so, so tiny, so little, so it doesn't look uh, strong enough to, to have a race. The car gets its name from its cage-like chassis containing about 200 chromoly steel tubes welded together. I saw a bird cage which had, it's pretty much open and there was an aluminum, an additional aluminum uh, uh, fuel tank which was positioned like a dashboard, you know, covering from the, over the legs of the driver until, until the windshield just to get this, to get this done. I mean, they were sitting among all this fuel. From my point of view, these have been the real heroes. The engine, with its flowing dynamic curves, is also as light as it is powerful, with a top speed of almost 170 miles per hour. I love the fact that every boat cage is fractionally different. You know, no two are identical. The way the body is treated is, is unique. You all, always know, not only is it Maserati, it's also a bird cage. In the early 60s, the bird cage wins the Nürburgring 1000 kilometer race twice. It also celebrates victories at the Cuban Grand Prix and at the Four Hours of Rouen in France. In 1960, the Sicilian Nino Vaccarella from Palermo contests the Targa Florio in a Maserati birdcage. I'm sure he learned it inside out. The track, he knew every, every pothole, every, you know, tricky corner, everything. You know, exactly what to do there and there. So Nino is a unique species of a race driver for the Targa Florio. My beginnings were indeed very turbulent. First, I smashed my father's car, then my brother-in-law's, at a time when a car was something really valuable. Especially as we had just come out of the war, it was a difficult period. In a long race like that, the most important thing is to be consistent rather than running at the limit. Going off a racetrack like the Targa, that would mean the end. Yes, Vaccarella knows the roads on his island like the back of his hand. With Umberto Maglioli, he takes the lead in the early afternoon of May 8th, 1960. I drove the birdcage at the 1960 Targa Florio. Maglioli passed on the car to me when he was in second place, being two minutes late. Bonnier was first, and then I took over the lead. I went in the test, the Sicilians had to imagine and then the Sicilians began to dream. They were very proud. They themselves felt like the winner when a Sicilian was about to win. This great joy was unfortunately brought to an abrupt end. In the final round, my gas tank broke and I had to stop. The dream suddenly had an end. This event is won by Bonnier on Porsche. Baccarella wins the Targa Florio several times in later years on Ferrari. Maserati was a kind of home. At Ferrari, it was a bit strict. There was a stern discipline. At Maserati, one was in one's element. Everything was easier. One felt more human contact. You felt a kind of friendship, although it was a big factory. Between 1950 and 1957, Maserati takes part in a total of 69 Formula One World Championship Grand Prix races. It records nine victories, 10 pole positions, and 15 fastest laps. However... They spent too much money in racing, so then they couldn't afford anymore, and there, of course, a lot of things um, happened then, you know, in a negative way. I think Maserati were going through further changes uh, and there was some indecision as to whether they could allocate the time and effort to prepare these engines. So Adolfo Orsi decides to focus heavily on road cars to attract more buyers to Maserati showrooms. The company's first attempt at the Gran Turismo market and large volume production is the 3500 GT. 
Maserati's chief engineer, Giulio Alfieri, develops two 2 plus 2 prototypes. One, a superleggera body by Carrozzeria Touring of Milan, the other by Carrozzeria Alemano. Over seven years, Maserati builds more than 2,200 units of this car. As the company faces economic troubles, relatively strong sales for the 3500 GT help keep Maserati afloat with a new clientele. As for the GTs, I'd say that from 1957 onwards, when the 3500 was developed, the driver was taken more and more into account and his identification with the car. Maserati focused more on a driver interested in a comfortable, beautiful car, but that still reminds one of a racing car. One had a kind of aristocratic driver in mind. It was a, a very clear development, uh, trying to move Maserati in the Olympus of the GT car production. The 3500 is a significant step for Maserati. It is one of the most exquisite classic grand touring cars of the period. The clients of Maserati were real gentlemen. They would give us their concrete ideas for the design and normally ask for a particular coloring of the car. We had a very wide range of colors. In 1958, Maserati came out with the fastest car in the world. It was the Maserati 5000 GT with 280 kilometers per hour. The first car the Shah of Persia bought. The um, uh, Shah of Persia was uh, a, a definitely a, a Maserati uh, personage and loved Maseratis. On the factory visit, um, through one of the buildings, the Shah um, noticed a pile of engines, a stack of uh, 450S racing motors. And uh, he looked at those and said, well, what are these? And they explained what it was, and uh, it was a racing motor. He said, well, I want that model car, but with this motor. And so the, a, a new Maserati model was born called the 5000 GT. After the car's first body by Touring, the main partner beginning in 1960 becomes Carrozzeria Alemano. Other builders are Pietro Frua, Monterosa, Pininfarina, Ghia, Giovanni Michelotti, and Bertone. This is a, a record, to my understanding, of the most different uh, coach shops building a, a single model car. All the VIPs had their cars designed by us, the way they wanted it. It is Prince Karim Aga Khan IV who, in 1963, commissions Frua with a vehicle. The Aga Khan uh, was quite interested in the car, but uh, felt that having a prototype uh, was a car that wasn't a, a serious car. Frua never built rollers or... or uh, uh, Tack together cars. He's, his prototypes um, were always fully 100% functioning cars. So uh, they convinced the Aga Khan that the second one would be built for him. It would be the only additional car built. And uh, so the second car was put into production and sold to the Aga Khan. The first Maserati that I designed was a Maserati by Bertone. It was the Maserati 5000. All eight 5000 GT models are based on an identical running gear. So is the Bertoni. Every designer has a specific approach. There are no rules. Not like in aerodynamics, where you have to keep absolutely certain rules in order to get a certain result. The aesthetics, however, are completely intuitive. Harmony has always something magical. You feel it. Is it too high, too low, too curvy, too wide? You must observe and then make a decision. 
In 1965, the Mexico is added to Maserati's range of elegant and prestigious creations. The Vignale body is first used on a 5000 GT chassis, which an important Mexican customer has shipped to Italy for repair after crashing it. Hence the model's name, Mexico. Maserati would not fully stop production on cars that were eventually going to be stopped uh, and would introduce new models so there was an overlap. And that overlap allowed Maserati in, in the middle 60s to produce and have in a, in a showroom up to five or six models of cars that were newly available. And uh, just the diversity and uh, variety was just staggering. In honor of Maserati's 1957 victory at the Sebring 12-hour race, Maserati nicknames a two-door 2 plus 2 coupe Sebring, launched in 1963. Employing all but the Maserati 3500's coachwork, it reaches 137 miles per hour. It is aimed at both the American and European Gran Turismo markets, with the intention of spreading the Maserati name even further. Winds are fast. They bring change and carry people to new and exciting places. Those who can harness the wind have been revered through history. Wind has long been a metaphor for power and speed. When Mario Maserati chose the trident held by Neptune, the Roman god of the sea, he proved to be a visionary. Maserati also has historical links with marine transportation. Its engines have so far successfully propelled racing boats to various powerboat championships in Italy and around the world. Today, Maserati is also setting sailing records. The company lends its name to a boat that represents a unique synthesis of nautical technology. Maserati assists Giovanni Soldini, one of the world's most renowned yachtsmen with many years of experience in oceanic races, to break three historic North Atlantic sailing records. Wind. Manufacturers go to great length in naming cars and seeking titles that convey their brand image accurately. After many years of alphanumeric names, Maserati becomes known for the very innovative naming of its models after different winds. It all began with normal names, like for the 5000 GT. Later, they chose the names of winds. This was unique and was also part of the success of Maserati. Choosing the name of wind is a good way to indicate movement. The first in a series of classic Maseratis to be given the name of a wind is the Mistal. The name refers to a violent and cold north wind in France. The car is anything but cold. It has a sleek body, a top speed of 155 miles per hour, and it comes in coupe and spider versions. Built between 1963 and 1970, the Mistral will be the last model from the house of the Trident to have the famous straight six-cylinder twin-spark double overhead cam engine as fitted to the Maserati 250F Grand Prix cars. By the time production ends in 1970, over 828 coupe and 100 spider versions of the Mistral are sold. This comes as no surprise, as the Mistral is generally considered as one of the most beautiful Maseratis of all time. From now on, for a number of years, all of the sports car models are named after winds, and all of the four-seaters after racing circuits. But there is an exception to every rule. In 1963, the Quattro Porte is launched, a move from a sports coupe to a luxury saloon, and a sporty one. The instinct of Adolfo Orsi is as strong as the attraction of the world's fastest saloon with a top speed of 150 miles per hour. The body design is entrusted to Fruer, which harkens back to the Aga Khan's 5000 GT. They needed money. They decided to take a Formula One engine, as is, 
and implement it in a sports luxury sedan. That was the birth of the first uh, Quattroporta. The Italian name literally means four doors. While the design is by Fruer, the construction is carried out by Vignale. It is equipped with a 4.1 liter V8 engine producing 256 horsepower. Between 1963 and 1966, 230 units are made. In the late 1960s, a truly unexpected collaboration between the Italians and the English emerges. Originally developed in 1957, the Maserati 250FT2 engine, capable of 300 horsepower, is well ahead of its time. In 1966, with the change in F1 regulations requiring the switch from 1.5 to 3-liter naturally aspirated engines, several English racing teams find themselves in trouble. British Cooper racing team manager Roy Salvadori, who had himself raced in the 250Fs, contacts Maserati and requests permission to use the Italian's V12 engine. And Cooper looked around and looked as Thor, and they saw that there had been a history, obviously Maserati's history in motorsport, and they thought there might be the opportunity for Maserati to, be, to return. The Cooper T81, fitted with this engine, able to deliver 380 horsepower, proves to be competitive, especially in the second half of the 1966 season. Salvadori asks British driver John Surtees to join the team. He works with Maserati engineer Alfieri on getting the engine to go a little better. Surtees turns out to be a heaven-sent opportunity for the Cooper team. I suggested one or two things, like I thought the Morelli ignition uh, would help it. It's a little bit like stepping back in time because the test house was there and uh, it had the engine set up and not standing outside, gazing at all the instruments, of course. Uh, inside there, working the throttle lever and the noise and the smoke and steam and oil and everything. Uh, it, uh, but that was, you know, great. The Cooper Maserati finishes second in the US Grand Prix with Jochen Rindt at the wheel. Surtees drives the Cooper Maserati T81 to victory in the 1966 Mexican Grand Prix. Alfieri had been working on getting the settings of the engine correct for the high altitude. Although it started a little bit, being a little lean on the first lap, uh, then it came on song and ran beautifully, and we won the race and brought the Cooper Maserati World Championship win. The relationship between Cooper and Maserati is only short-lived. Due to budget issues, Surtees moves on to Honda. The Cooper Maserati team is soon dissolved. When I went to the coach builder Ghia, I was fortunate to meet Alfieri from Maserati, who commissioned me with the Ghibli. And so, I wanted to do something different than I had been doing before. The V8-powered car, designed by Giugiaro, is named after a Mediterranean wind famous for reaching hurricane speeds. Quite fitting for a fast super saloon. Giugiaro's um, elegance, his, his, his talent, his ability was such that he, he could take that car, uh, car design in his head, put it on paper, to the point that it's near, quite, quite near a finished product. Maserati releases the Ghibli in 1967 as a two-door, two-plus-two Grand Tourer. It proves to be the most popular Maserati vehicle since the automaker withdrew from building racing cars in the 1950s. The car accelerates from zero to 60 miles per hour in 6.8 seconds and reaches a top speed of 154 miles per hour. Even by the standards of its time and class, the car consumes copious volumes of fuel. 
Maserati fits the car with two 50-liter fuel tanks, which can be filled via flaps on either side of the roof pillars. It soon became the car to have for celebrities, for uh, personalities, for captains of industry, for uh, royalty. Uh, a lot of famous people uh, flocked to the Ghibli. Like the CEO of the Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford II, he is so impressed by the Ghibli that he approaches Orsi with an offer to buy the company from him. The Italian declines, despite the fact that Maserati is short of cash due to the financial problems generated by Argentina's failure to pay for its industrial purchases of machine tools after the overthrow of General Perón. Who knows what would have become of the company had it been sold to HF2, the American Henry Ford II. It, it went with some ups and downs pretty well until 1967, and then it was, it was, it was gone. In 1968, the Orsi family sells Maserati to the automaker Citroën. The French modernize and reorganize the venerable Modenese firm, the clearest evidence being the replacement of obsolete models using old-fashioned technology. You had to be more cutting edge um, in, the, in the early 70s um, to mid-70s than um, uh, staying with a more classical Orsi style of design. The Bora is the most advanced and accomplished of all the first generation mid-engined cars. Who do you go to to design at that era something out of the box um, and something stunning to follow up the success of the Ghibli? Naturally, you go back to Giorgetto Giugiaro. Powered by a 330 horsepower 4.7 liter V8, the supercar reaches a top speed of around 174 miles per hour. It is considered by some to be the pinnacle of Maserati performance. Lamborghini and Di Tommaso already have the Miura and the Mangusta. Ferrari is developing the Dino. Creativity was at its best during the days of Ghibli. But the market demanded a reduction in costs. And so the Mirac was developed. The Merak is essentially a junior version of the Bora. It uses the same body shell front clip, but in a 2 plus 2 configuration, made possible by using a smaller, lighter, and less powerful Maserati V6 engine, which is also used in the Citroën SM. The Citroën SM, a unique combination of French style and Italian power. This high-performance coupe has its first competitive outing, winning the grueling 1971 Rallye du Maroc. The SM is a magnificent car, one of the highlights of the Citroën era. And then there was this incredible boomerang. It's my favorite. The car fit the time perfectly. When we think of the 70s, we, we think of all these crazy shapes that now almost seem mad, almost like in a car meant for outer space. The boomerang. Not only its wild, wedge-like angles and shapes are unique, but also the dashboard layout. The steering wheel and gauge cluster are part of a single console that emerges from the dash, and the steering wheel rotates around the stationary gauges. The Maserati Boomerang the Maserati Boomerang is a completely different model. It's not elegant and sporty per se. The car breaks all tradition. With it, we revolutionized everything, including the way of driving. 
The boomerang from 1971 is fully registered as a road car, but it is always intended as a one-off show car, something unheard of nowadays. We have nor the time, nor the money, nor anything to waste to do these you know, one-off show cars, and then you, you show them, uh, you make some bus, and then you park them in the museum or in the garage. Although the car is destined to remain just a pure design exercise, it clearly influences other models of the era, such as the distinctive Grand Tourer Maserati Kamsin. Designed by Marcello Gandini from Bertoni, it is part of an era of a perfect storm, named after an Egyptian desert wind. A series of events makes Maserati face some of the darkest years in its history. The repercussions of the conflict between the Arab nations that attack Israel in October 1973 will soon be felt around the world. Many of the Arab nations involved in the Yom Kippur War are countries that produce the majority of the world's oil. They convince OPEC to put an embargo on the supply of oil to countries that supported Israel. As a result of the oil shortage, the price of gasoline skyrockets. We are heading toward the most acute shortages of energy since World War II. The public feels the hit at the pumps. The auto industry feels it at the dealerships. With gas so expensive, people are no longer buying cars in the numbers they had before the crisis. Let's drive under 50 miles an hour and save electricity where possible. If we all help, we'll really be helping ourselves. Please, don't be foolish. Well, my view is it's a bigger oil crisis now than it was then. I think the public opinion and, and the way people reacted to these things was probably overreaction, which it usually is. But that didn't seem to matter because, you know, the, the motor manufacturers, specialized cars were suffering in a huge way and lost a lot of orders. And some of them went under and the stronger ones didn't go under. Still, during this difficult phase, Maserati builds several iconic cars. The Medici and the 124, another beautiful coupe designed by Giugiaro, a replacement for the Maserati Indy by Giovanni Michelotti, built around the Indy chassis and engine. In a way, we are egoists. We do what pleases ourselves and then hope that the choice we made pleases many others as well. If so, we have produced a successful product. But sales in the mid-70s are definitely declining. The future of Citroën-owned Maserati is more than uncertain. It took them six years until they raised the white flag. The French company's financial problems lead to the sale of Maserati to French automaker Peugeot. Peugeot, however, considers liquidating the company. Thus, Maserati would be broken up and sold. Hundreds of men and women employed by Maserati would be out of work. The Italian government was very uh, concerned about the loss of jobs. The economy was not that great. They wanted to keep Maserati alive for those jobs. Um, so uh, a partnership was formed with De Tommaso and the Italian government uh, funding uh, De Tommaso to take over Maserati. In the second half of the 1970s, Alejandro Di Tommaso, a former race car driver and entrepreneur from Argentina, manages to rescue the company from the brink of disaster. He largely abandons the mid-engine sports car in favor of squarely styled front-engined rear-drive coupes with aggressive performance. First comes the release of the Maserati Kialami that takes its name from the Grand Prix circuit in South Africa. The four-seater coupe designed by Pietro Frura has a top speed of 150 miles per hour. It is well known for the fundamental validity of its design, with a well-balanced, stiff chassis offering excellent body control. Between 1976 and 1983, 210 kilometers are built.
The model is a modest success and allows the company to release the Quattro Porte III in 1977, designed by Giugiaro. It is a rear-wheel drive car powered by a large V8 engine. La realtà. The reality is mathematics. The sketches are always full of pleasure and euphoria. Their purpose is to seduce. The new Quattro Porte seduces many. It is important to Di Tommaso to compete with the recently launched Mercedes-Benz 450 SEL. This limousine marks the last of the hand-built Italian cars. All exterior joints and seams are filled to give a seamless appearance. I want the seam. Sometimes one designs the forms which are not very far from an erotic image. When you design an object, then you don't necessarily get inspired by the female body, but somehow it is still in your head. So there is something unconscious that you have to express. Even in a car, you can detect erotic aspects or things that can convince others, be it women or men, for it is an object that expresses our creativity in this world. But in the end, a car is just mathematics. The size, the length, the curves, the lines. Di Tommaso believes that the saloon is the answer to the needs of many customers in the world's GT market. His gut feeling proves to be right, for within two years of production, it becomes Maserati's best-selling car, accounting for over 60% of total production. The even more luxurious Quattroporti Royale serves as limousine to Italy's president, Sandro Pertini the Vatican, and for tenor Luciano Pavarotti. Maserati always stood and also st stands today, and it's part of our DNA. It stands for understatement, it stands for luxury. To buy a Maserati, you, are, you, you, you demonstrate, first of all, that you want to distinct yourself. You, 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 you reject the uniformity which is out there today. It is with this new Quattro Porte that Maserati begins a fascinating new chapter in its history. Sales slowly begin to climb as Maserati enters the 1980s. Di Tommaso's further plan is to combine the prestige of the Maserati brand with new models that would be more affordable than the earlier high-priced types that had traditionally made up the Maserati range. For the mass appeal of Maserati, uh, he came up with the bi-turbo design a unit, small unitized chassis, twin turboed. The car offered incredible performance. Um, with those twin turbos, um, it, it would uh, run the circles around the Ferrari 308, provided it was running uh, and running properly. Designed by Pier Angelo Andriani, an engineer from the Di Tommaso team, the bi-turbo is somewhat influenced by the design of Giugiaro's recent Quattroporti III. From 1981 into the 1990s, more than 30 different versions of the bi-turbo are produced. Sadly, however, Maseratis of the 1980s in general are very temperamental. It is unfortunate for the man who saved Maserati that sales of his cars begin to decline. This, combined with the fact that Maserati pulls out of the North American market, leaves Di Tommaso looking to sell. For everything that was said about Alexander, uh, uh, etc., the pros and the cons, uh, there is a fact that at least it kept it going. It kept it going, it kept the site all there, it was all complete. It happened. And it did allow then, uh, when Fiat came along, uh, for there to be something and the name still surviving. When Fiat takes grasp of the Trident in 1993, Alejandro Di Tommaso retains a collection of Maserati cars that was started by the Maserati brothers and expanded under the ownership of both Orsi and Di Tommaso. News breaks that the entire collection is due to be put under the hammer. 
This sparks an outcry in Italy. Umberto Panini, owner of the famous publishing company, steps in, buys the collection, and houses them in a purpose-built museum near Modena. There is much rejoicing across the land. The collection contains many of the most stunningly beautiful and rare Maseratis ever produced. My father had seen it all as property, property and assets of the city that should not be sold. And he's done this out of great respect for the cause. The company's sale to Fiat is yet another turning point in Maserati's roller coaster history. In 1997, Maserati makes another big step on its climb back from the bottom. Ferrari, now owned by Fiat, takes the reins at Maserati that was left somewhere between life and death. It was somewhat cynical and ironical to give Maserati to its arch rival uh, uh, Ferrari to give it a fresh start. Soon after, Maserati's manufacturing methods improve considerably. State-of-the-art assembly lines are installed, which require a huge remodeling of the decades-old facilities. It helps Maserati climb up to over 2,000 cars produced a year, a great improvement over previous years. We immediately started to reorganize, re-engineer, fix all the issues. An important release under the new management is the 3200 GT, a streamlined coupe created by Giorgetto Giugiaro's Ital design in 1998. The twin turbocharged V8 produces 370 horsepower. Top speed is almost 180 miles per hour. From 2002 until early 2005, Ferrari and Maserati operate on the automotive scene jointly as the Ferrari-Maserati Group, although they continue to remain separate companies. In 2005, Maserati is split off from Ferrari and returns to Fiat Auto. Maserati continues to work in cooperation with Ferrari, however. The Italians have always said, that the Italian gentlemen buy Maseratis and the Italian playboys buy Ferraris. Of course, that was why I had one of each. But <laughs> Maserati's success on the track stretches back decades. It begins with Carlo Maserati's first work on motorizing bicycles and has continued right up to the speeding giants that can be seen on the international raceways of today. The release of the Maserati MC-12 in 2004 is the big step in Maserati's return to racing after 37 years. Under the guidance of technical director Giorgio Ascanelli, a race car is developed eligible for the FIA GT Championship, a racing series organized at the behest of the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile. We really worked a lot on it and did a great deal of development testing very methodical, a lot of dedication as it corresponds to the philosophy of Maserati. We then had a vehicle that already won in the first 24 hours of Spa. Andrea Bertolini serves as the chief test driver throughout development and drives the MC-12 to several victories. Of course, there was some cooperation between Maserati and Ferrari as they belonged together. However, all Maserati racing cars were independently developed. The mean machine remains the most potent Maserati to date. It can reach 205 miles per hour. For six years, may I say this? We dominated the world of GT cars. An important requirement for participation in the FIA GT is the production of a road version. A total of 50 Maserati Corse Stradales are built for customers, each of which are pre-sold for approximately 700,000 US dollars. The MC-12 certainly gets people's attention, but it takes more to make Maserati even more powerful. 
For that, the house of the Trident needs another kind of car, the new Quattroporte. And there was the fifth generation launched in 2003 by Ferrari. We relaunched it with an automatic gearbox, peaked the volumes in, in, in 2006. The sedan, designed by Pininfarina, receives high praise for its blend of new features, comfort, and speed of almost 170 miles per hour. Throughout its existence, Maserati's best road cars have tended to be grand touring cars. Car design has followed uh, the evolution uh, and the macro trends of the society. Pininfarina believes that car design in the 1960s was passionate, in the 70s minimal and somewhat radical, in the 80s it was decorative and organic, and in the 90s it was very rational. And uh, now is uh, diversified and globalized, exactly like society. The design company understands the evolution of society. Its Gran Turismo of 2007 is a nod to Maserati's history with a modern twist. The coupe with its 4.2 liter V8 engine and 405 horsepower has a top speed of almost 180 miles per hour. The push for the Gran Turismo MC Stradale comes from existing Maserati customers who want a road legal super sports car. The Gran Turismo MC Trofeo's roots can be found in this road model. With it, Maserati again re-enters the racing arena. The Trofeo Maserati is held since 2003. It is an all-inclusive single mark championship. It enabled a new category of gentleman drivers to race for pleasure. Watching the competition among the drivers is such fun. And to experience a Maserati Gran Turismo when 28 engines are ignited is a great feeling. Trofeo races are held on Europe's most prestigious circuits, but also in the US, always combined with top-level motorsports events such as FIA GT competitions. The drivers find the identical cars all race ready. Operated and managed by a professional organization that really sees to everything. In 2007, we, uh, the, the reorganization, reconstruction, re-engineering uh, paid off. It was the first, let's say, economic profit and, and positive result. I don't remember since how many years for, for Maserati. The, the reason why companies exist, despite all the passion and the people and everything, is if you don't make money, you're gonna close. Sooner or later, this business will die. 2008. This is the phase when Harald Wester, CEO of Maserati, decides to take the next step. He convinces the shareholders and Sergio Marchioni the group CEO, to trust him and his team and to make another significant investment into Maserati. What inspires and motivates someone like Vester to take on this big challenge? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a question of, of what you wanna, what you, what you wanna do in life, what, 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 what is fun. I think when something is really I don't want to say destroy it, but it's really questionable whether the, this plane is going to take off or never ever again um, will fly. The degree of freedom, um, the potential of change, changing the organization, working with the people is much bigger than in a mature, rich, uh, successful organization. I wanted to become one of these special people. The real special people are survivors. Special people are also the various leading coach builders of Italy Maserati has always worked with. Pininfarina, Zagato, Turing, Fruel, Bertoni, Alemano, Moneschi, Vignale, Gear, and Ital Design. The founders, like Mr. Bertone or my grandfather, they, were, they had strong characters, they were very charismatic. Their characters could be found in the projects. It must be slightly odd when they're 
they're working for these different houses, uh, trying to keep that feel that that's definitely a Ferrari, that's definitely, um, definitely Maserati. One of the most respected automotive designers currently strutting the halls of Maserati is ex Pininfarina man Lorenzo Ramachotti. The man who has been referred to by Top Gear as the king of Italian car design. For him, design is very important in helping to build the uniqueness and recognizability of a brand. Uh, if you look back in the history of Maserati, every car was kind of new chapter. They worked with all the major Italian designers and their cars are really a broad coverage um, of trends through the time. Two of Ramachotti's favorite designs have come from the latter quarter of his career, the Gran Turismo and the reborn sixth generation Quattroporti. Ferrari provides the heart to our machine. We are together out there to represent Italian excellence. The world has changed, and Maserati too has changed. We are trying to bring the Maserati in today's time and give them the size of today's time. The Italianness and the Italian roots, the Italian flavor, uh, are an important ingredient of our brand. We will not build Maseratis out of Italy. In 2013, Maserati announces the legendary Ghibli will be revived as the Ghibli 3. The mid-sized sedan offers V6 petrol and, for the first time in Maserati's history, diesel engines, as well as a twin-turbo Ferrari V6 in the performance model. Maserati is moving with the times and is constantly evolving, more than ever. Sergio Marchioni, Maserati's chairman, even refers to this movement as the Maserati Revolution. Adopting to the auto market of the day is one of the main reasons Maserati has been able to stay in business for so many decades. Yes, the Tridente is back in business in many parts of the world. The United States has been, is, and may remain Maserati's most important market. China has become the second most important pillar in the world. The Middle East, together with Central Europe, accounts for another third of the market. 2014 is an important year in many ways. It's the Trident's 100th anniversary. This, the company celebrates with the presentation of its stunning Alfieri, a brand new throwback to the company's great two-door race-inspired cars of the 1950s. This car has a racing pedigree, but it also possesses a kick of poetry. Its name has a provenance. It was Alfieri Maserati, the founder of the brand, who set up shop in Bologna a hundred years ago. In the founding family's hands, Maserati became one of the most admired and most winning European marks. Few companies have survived as many setbacks as Maserati. It has weathered wars, several ownership changes, even the threat of liquidation and fierce competition from corporate giants. Through all of this, the Italian automotive icon has not only survived, but thrived. Maserati reminds us that with steadfast commitment to hard work and unwavering passion, we can all overcome hardship and achieve what we set out to do. We are million, millions of miles away from being ignorant or arrogant or giving anything for granted. We are entering the company each and every morning with recharged batteries full of energy um, to prepare the next strike against the Giants.
Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to conviction of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy.